Good morning. Welcome to the Free Speech Commission's second public hearing. Um, just to get a show of hands, how many folks would like to speak this morning? It's going to be like last time. We have one. Last time, nobody wanted to come forward, and then by the end, we had lots of people coming forward. So hopefully, we get the same thing here, or is everybody truly here to listen? OK. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so what we'll do is we'll give you about five minutes to speak. Um, commission members may want to ask you some questions. Um, if the first person or two doesn't get things rolling, and nobody else shows up at the door in that time, then we may just decide thank you very much and resume our um, group discussion. Um, so we ask you to sign in. We have a sign-up sheet here. If you could just print your name and then your affiliation, faculty, staff, or student, we'd appreciate that very much. Uh, we have a second microphone, which is... Sure. Okay. So um, what we can do is I'll um, hand this off here, and then can I pick that one up and take it to someone who has a question so that they can be heard as well? OK, great. So that'll be the process. If anybody has a question for the speaker at the end, um, assuming we have time for all the speakers, which it looks like we do, um, then we will move the microphone to the questioner so that everybody can hear the question. OK, Nuala, did you want to step up? It's not I haven't seen it. I don't see anybody else. Hi. Um, so I was going to make these comments during our meeting, um, but I have class from 12 to 1, so I figured this would be a good time to just get my thoughts on the record, um, specifically regarding question the first and the second question that we've asked folks to answer today. The first question being, should policies regarding the uses of lower and upper sprawl, including the Savio steps by registered student organizations and non-affiliate members of the public, be revisited? If so, how do you recommend the policies be changed. Um, as per our previous conversation, I'm not sure if this is still a point of contention, but I just really wanted to reiterate that those policies should not be changed because it would severely hinder the right of free assembly by students. Um, we've seen this through the Black Lives Matters protests. We've seen this through the demonstrations on Sproul the day after the election in 2016. We don't want to hinder those kinds of demonstrations. We also don't want to hinder other types of political activism that happen on Spiral Plaza, um, upper and lower. Um, but more importantly, I really wanted to address the second question. Should RSOs be able to reserve multiple consecutive days on lower and upper sprawl? And I understand why this is a really important question and why it's very contentious. But I just really wanted to highlight that there are student organizations that do reserve upper sprawl for multiple consecutive days that do not have malicious intent, and I don't want us to be putting these student organizations at a disadvantage. This includes um, the Armenian Students Association for Armenian Genocide Remembrance Week in April. This includes the Students for Justice in Palestine for their week of resistance. This includes um, the students who protest students, in justice, students for justice in Palestine that same week. We don't want to hinder any of these expressions of free speech. And less controversially, rally committee reserves upper sprawl for multiple days leading up to the big game. So I just really wanted to make sure that we had these other examples in mind when we discuss being able to reserve upper and lower sprawl for multiple days. Um, and then I think we've addressed a lot of the other questions already. Questions for me? I, I do have a question. How about, um, I, I have a question about reserving lower sprawl. Is that something that happens a lot with uh, RSOs at present and um, uh, also for multiple days? Um, to the best of my understanding, there is much less political activism happening on Lower Sproul, but there are reasons why student orgs would want to reserve Lower Sproul, perhaps for a fair. Um, I know that currently the ASUC is looking into lower sprawl for next November um, around civic engagement. So, you know, there's reasons why we would want that space to be reserved. And I think putting blanket restrictions on the reservation of either lower or upper sprawl for multiple days could lead to unforeseen consequences and restrictions for student organizations that, you know, we can't anticipate right now. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. Um, so it, are the events you talked about, are they all day, multiple day events? Is there any distinction to be made in terms of you know, the noon hour or partial days? Yeah, so I know, um, just to go with rally committee, because that's probably the least controversial, um, they have their events between 11 and 1 p.m., 11 to 2 p.m. It's definitely not from 8 a.m. all the way to 4 p.m. And if the um, number of hours per day is something that we want to look into, that's definitely a way to um, go about looking at that policy. But um, yeah, more so from the multiple days perspective. Any other questions? Um, so uh, do you know of any current limit on consecutive days for uh, reservation? And I, I'm not sure if there, it's like a really popular reservation, but um, are there cases where like one group uh, might um, or like reserve the space for a long time and that might um, exclude other groups from being able to use it as well if they're uh, reserving it for multiple consecutive days? Um, as far as I understand, when um, weeks of cultural resistance or weeks of resistance happen um, between the pro-Palestine community and um, those who would oppose them, I don't think both student orgs have reserved that space, but nobody is going to stop you know, both student orgs from being there. Um, I don't know that there's a limit. Maybe Marissa could speak to that. So currently, and we have folks from event services in the room, uh, there aren't current restrictions on the facilities that are reserved um, through ASUC event services, which includes um, for outdoor spaces. There are restrictions because we are a campus with many student organizations and very few resources and funding and in space. Uh, there, it is not uncommon to have reservation limits in other spaces. So for event services, those reservation limits are for their indoor spaces. Currently, it's a 521 reservation system for um, Eshleman and for MLK, a student organization receives five meeting rooms, two event spaces, including Bayview, which is here on the fifth floor, and Anahead Alumni Hall, and then one poly reservation for free per semester. So 521 per student organization per semester, and that's to allow for student organizations accessibility to those spaces. They may reserve more than that, but then they're going to pay the normal uh, fee that any outside organization would pay. There are currently no reservation limits for outdoor venues. And then for classroom scheduling, and I have those representatives in the room as well, there are also limits, and they are based on an hour system. So currently a student organization receives a 20 hour uh, time limit for uh, the semester. Oh, okay, <laughs> one more time. <laughs> When the dean of the law school asks you, answer. Okay, so the reservations limits for student organizations under ASUC event services, there are reservation limits of five meeting rooms, two event spaces, which includes Bayview on this floor, and Anahead Alumni Hall, which is um, adjacent to Max Martinez Commons, and one poly ballroom reservation. Um, the reservation per semester, per semester, one fall, one spring. Uh, the reservation limits for a student organization for classrooms is 20 hours per semester. Um, and that's, we, they used to operate it more in a kind of how many bookings or reservations you can do, but the, the availability of classrooms for student organizations is so finite that it needed to go down to the hours. A student organization might reserve a whole day and not really use the whole day, and that was um, keeping other folks out. Thank you. Let us ask, are there any other speakers? Okay, so let's continue with the questions. I just wanna make sure that we're not in, uh, impinging on anyone else's time to speak. Um, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that the 521 Bayview actually counts as a meeting room, so it's one of the five <laughs> reservations, and then the two event spaces are tilted in Anahead. Sorry, no, that's fine. <laughs> The other 
point of clarification that will need to be discussed here and, and against, uh, with the community is the difference between a booking and a reservation, as I discovered recently. <laughs> um, and Sarah and I have discussed this as well in event services. A booking um, for event services, and again, our, our policies are different per venue. You'll find that a student organization has to manage multiple policies, multiple protocol, multiple ways of reserving and booking spaces on this campus. It's gonna be different per department, it's going to be different for classrooms as it is for event services. Um, for event services, a reservation um, can be multiple days. So a booking is one day, particularly for one space. Uh, so, am I getting that right, Sarah? So a conference, for example, might be a three-day conference for event services, that is one reservation that includes three bookings on three different days, correct? Yeah. Okay. And that may not be uniform across campus, so we need to delineate a booking from a reservation, and if there are limits or if there ever is a conversation around limits to bookings, whether in upper or lower Sproul or in any other outdoor venue, we need to um, understand what that looks like, so right? So in a, in a, a group that hosts a multi-day event on upper or lower Sproul, to them, that is one event because it is a week of um, resistance. To the venue, it might be a five-day reservation. So we need to work through those. Other questions? Actually, I, I just do have a, a question, a point, point of information um, regarding reserving Sproul. Um, am I right in understanding that we allow non-student groups to reserve um, upper and lower sprawl. So we do have a limit on which outdoor spaces non-student groups can reserve. Campus departments can reserve the same as student organizations. And then for outside organizations, I believe it's upper and lower sprawl, Memorial Glade, and faculty glade, I'd have to double check and get back to you, but there's four that right. um, non-campus affiliates that are not RSOs can reserve. Okay. Good, I, I, just, I just mentioned that that seems to me something we, we might want to brainstorm about. We could, we, could, um, we, could, we could talk about the possibility of modifying that part of our policy without modifying the, um, the current policies regarding student groups. Any further questions? Sorry, I just double checked the four places and it's Lower Sproul, Campanile, Memorial Glade, and Faculty Glade. So they, can't, they, can't do so they cannot reserve Upper Sproul okay. or the Savio Steps. So it's Lower Sproul, Camp Campanile? Uh, Lower Sproul, Campanile, Memorial Glade, and Faculty Glade are the four. Next speaker. We have received written statements. Do we want to read those into the record? I can get them. Sure. You worked the last time. Some of them are lengthy. Some of them are lengthy. Okay, um, I'm reading a statement from uh, Rod Santos, uh, Residence Affairs Supervisor from the Office of the Registrar. On behalf of the Office of the Registrar, located in the fourth floor of Sproul Hall, we wanted to provide remarks and feedback for the Free Speech Commission. Uh, this compila compilation represents the various individual comments among 30 plus professional staff employed in OR. 
following comments correspond to a common theme around communication. Uh, bullet point one, OR recommends confidential trainings, briefings from other units, including UCPD, Dean of Students Office, Lead Center, to inform us on expectations of potentially disruptive events on campus. This can include explana explanation of why barriers are set up in these protest events, what speakers' events could potentially attend on campus and in the Berkeley community, explanation of the resource breakdowns of these events, explanation and presentation on the new events policy. We understand the necessity of not providing complete information about these events, but providing confidential information to staff will help better prepare the employees and supervisors in Sproul Hall. Bullet point two, email notifications, particularly those from student affairs listservs, sometimes take an hour or more to be received. We do not know the source of delay of listservs, but in order to communicate quickly, we have resorted to text messages to personal cell phones. It's important to fix the infrastructure of our campus communication methods to send timely notifications to staff. Uh, third point, there is a perception that the university was more sympathetic to who is protesting. Uh, the university should promote safe, nonviolent protest and limit the ability of unsafe protests. Some examples include providing forums for individuals of putting, opposing sides to engaging meaningful discourse, et cetera. Uh, next point, managers need better resources to adv advise their employees before these events. Such items uh, as talking points to the public for parents and students would be helpful in projecting a common message to our campus and community constituents. Managers also should have briefings, trainings on departmental preparation leading up to disruptive events, i.e. protocols to secure the building, how to negotiate time off for union employees during these events, et cetera. Uh, next point, communication in Sproul Hall needs to be better coordinated. All departments should have a systematic mode of communicating important timely messages and coordinating supervisors' actions if actions are at the discretion of each manager, such as dismissing of staff from the building. This expectation should be explicitly described or communicated to department directors and managers. Finally, alternative walking paths should be posted online so staff and students and the public can be advised on the campus areas to be avoided. Similarly, posting banned items as announcements to all staff and students should be exercised. Anecdotal information indicates that there were random searches. This information should be relayed confidentially to staff as the perception of randomized searches has different connotations to different communities. Do you want to read who that's from? Yeah, uh, that again was Rob Santos uh, from the resident um, office of the registrar. This is from Tommaso Baggia, and I, I don't see an affiliation. Dear Commission, I was a former student activist at UC Santa Cruz and current staffer at UC Berkeley. I grew up in Italy where the threat of fascism has always felt as real as it currently does in the United States. Some of the questions asked in the email are important ones. Others are troubling. Restricting all student organizations' ability to organize events just to prevent national white nationalist organizations from abusing our processes reek of disaster capitalism and overreaction. Creating more hoops for student organizations to jump through in order to bring different perspectives to campus shouldn't be the goal or the destination here. What there should be is clear guidelines for what content is allowed and what isn't, as is the case in most European institutions. This isn't a slippery slope issue. If the speaker has a history of instigating violence or discrimination against a protected class, i.e. hate speech, they shouldn't be allowed to speak at UC Berkeley. It's a pretty cut and dry line. I'm sure both Zionist and anti-Israel groups will battle over this, but this line is drawn there specifically to discourage fanaticism on either side. I wouldn't want a Stalinist organization bringing in a speaker just as much as I don't want Ann Coulter or Bannon coming to our campus. When literal Nazis were marching in Berkeley, the chancellor's top line mass message was around protecting freedom of speech a straw man built by the Nazis themselves in order to distract authorities while they put our broadly diverse student body and staff at risk. The march and marchers have a history of provoking and instigating violence. The university's top line concern should have been for the safety of its students and workers against hateful ideologies that go against all the values inherent in our education system. Just cause it's a state entity doesn't mean the university is above cultural debates, take a stand for the culture of inclusion and enlightenment that this university represents to so many people. Make it easier for students to organize. Their movements tend to be right in the long run. Tommaso. Uh, 
Okay, this next, um, does this go together? No. Oh, well, this next one is from uh, uh, Linda Rugg. Uh, no affiliation is given. Dear Chancellor Kristen, the members of the Free Speech Commission, thank you for the opportunity to offer suggestions on free speech matters on campus. I'm on sabbatical and unable to attend the sessions you have scheduled, so I'm offering some responses to your questions below. Um, should policies regarding uses of lower and upper sprawl be, by registered student organizations and non-affiliate members of the public be revisited? If so, how do you recommend the policies be changed? That's the question. Um, the answer is yes, I have a suggestion. Rather than allowing a single RSO to determine what type of event will occupy our simple, uh, central campus spaces, when a proposal is made that entails use of lower and upper sprawl, uh, a larger body of student representatives from a broad range of RSOs could be asked to vote on the proposal. Perhaps a representative committee could be formed of students from various groups to determine whether the proposed event will be of value to the larger community. The students should be asked to consider whether the event will disrupt campus life and whether the disruption is warranted by the value the campus would receive from the event. Uh, number two, should RSOs be able to reserve multiple consecutive days on lower and upper sprawl? Uh, no, I think it unlikely that any single RSO would design a program that would be of such great interest to the general population of campus that the program should occupy our primary public spaces for more than a day or really even more than half a day. Activities like Cal Day or Homecoming can serve as examples of the kind of programs that require that kind of space. They are campus-wide activities of interest to the wider community as well. I can't think of a single RSO that should be given that kind of control of our general public spaces over the course of more than one day. If, on the other hand, a group of RSOs planned an event, let's say all the singing groups or all the environmental groups, they might have a program that stretched over a couple of days, but not a single RSO. Three, what's the right size for an RSO? Um, um, comment, I'm not sure that this is the right question. There are plenty of very small student groups who do good things on campus. The problem is the nature of the kind of event that has been proposed recently and the cost to our campus and thus to students who had no control over the kind of event planned. Four, should an RSO be active for a certain amount of time before it's allowed to stage a major event on campus? Um, answer, again, I think that this might not be relevant. If we were to consider the suggestion I made uh, above concerning um, students reserving uh, upper and lower sprawl, a larger group of student representatives from an array of organizations could be asked to consider the value of the proposed event. Five, how can the campus minimize repeated disruption of the same area of campus by major events? Answer, I think there should be some financial and legal responsibility attached to any event. If a student organization organizes an event thinking that the provocative nature of the speaker will provide some benefit to the campus, the result of the provocation should be the responsibility of the organization. For instance, if speakers invited by a student organization can be reasonably expected not to observe campus guidelines for student conduct, and the speaker then proceeds, as could reasonably be predicted, to violate our campus guidelines, the inviting student organization should face sanctions according to our student code. If property is destroyed or the university incurs significant security costs for a speaker who can reasonably be expected to bring about that kind of result, the organization should be prepared to shoulder costs. These costs should not fall to students or other members of the community who had no say in inviting the speaker or organizing the event. Yes. Uh, Do you want to speak? Do you care to come to speak? Come forward to speak? Not particularly, but I'm sort of curious about this uh, the first suggestion on that list that was just read about making a uh, about making a uh, student representative uh, council of sorts. Uh, that seems redundant to me somehow because the requests for the use of uh, upper and lower sprawl are already reviewed by by uh, somebody in the university right i'm not sure exactly what that would do and uh of course someone else can disagree with me but that doesn't seem like a very uh a useful kind of suggestion I believe the level of review being proposed goes well beyond any current review. This, um, so so uh, this would be quite a, um, a dramatic change in policies. So um, I, I take your final comment to be to the effect that it's it's not a 
recommendation we should we should implement? We don't currently have what what is sounds like is being proposed as an event review committee, um, which could be any combination of student, staff, and faculty. We don't currently have that. Um, I do believe there might be some precedent for this at other UCs, though it's not necessarily one that happens here. Uh, there is. Um, other UCs are, are also discussing the same topic, and I can ask my counterparts at the other institutions to find out, is there precedent for this? My fear for this is that it creates more, more bureaucracy in an already bureaucracy-heavy process for our student organizations, and I don't want to make things more cumbersome to hold, to hold an event on campus. Um, I do want to be more intentional about how we work with students to host successful events that have... Um, you know, as much positive impact as possible on campus. So that's subjective. I get that. So, um, yes. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments on this input? Oh. I have uh, another question that is uh, a legitimate question, not specifically related to what was just read, but uh, a lot of what we're talking about here is Would you with. Like to uh, come up to the podium? Um. I don't think I have so much to say, uh, but uh, a lot of what we're uh, we've been discussing is, of course, with the registered student organizations, but. Uh, just in my experience walking through these public spaces, public spaces on campus, I very frequently find people who I would suspect are not part of any kind of registered student organization who are in the space using it for what they're using it for, uh, oftentimes speaking or preaching in different kinds of ways. And I was wondering what uh, the university attitude is towards these kinds of things, people who are just there speaking and uh, probably not making a whole lot of disruption, but you know, possibly in certain circumstances. Just to clarify, are you talking about upper and lower sprawl? Uh, uh, upper and lower sprawl, yes, but also just other places on campus. I know specifically that there's a, an individual who uh, preaches basically every single day outside of Dwinell Hall. And uh, while he hasn't been disruptive to my class experience there, I've heard from my friends who have classes in Dwinell Hall that he is audible from the classrooms and therefore potentially disruptive. So I can answer like the first part of the question, which is that <clears throat> upper and lower Sproul Hall are exempt from all the campus's other regulations about free speech. Um, anyone can come between the hours of 6 a.m. and 12 midnight and hold forth an upper, an upper and lower sprawl plaza. Um, <clears throat> the only time they're allowed to use amplified sound is between the hours of 12 and 1 p.m. and 5 and 7 p.m. Otherwise, the space is there for people to engage in whatever discourse they please. Um, other parts of campus, that's not necessarily the case. And all of this is found under um, um, the uh, Berkeley Campus Procedures Implementing University Policies. Uh, that regulates, the t it's the time, place, and manner regulations for the campus. Anybody else wanna respond to any part of that input? Thank you. Thank you. So in the interest of fairness, we'll just read, we have two more public comments um, that were submitted in writing, and we'll read these, and we haven't seen these, so pardon me if I'm tripping. This one is a rather lengthy one, so hold on. Dear, uh, this is from Brian Gia, I'm sorry, Gia Keltsis. Um, I may get the name, I have gotten the name wrong. Dear Free Speech Commission, I'm writing this email in place of my attendance and public comment on the topic of free speech on the UC Berkeley campus. While I support tenets of free speech to their core, I do not support or endorse enabling any platform for free speech. Some interpretations of our laws may dictate that any person has the right to say anything at any time, but we know that this is not the case. If one were to yell fire in a crowded space or bomb on an airplane, the speaker would be denied their right to speech just as in the case of off-campus provocateurs speaking intentionally disruptive information given the content, context of the speech. 
i.e. a progressive and protective community of intelligent and sensitive students, faculty, and staff. I don't hope to deny people their right to express themselves, but it is wrong to equate freedom of speech with freedom of financially burdensome platform for this speech. We should be questioning our laws on a larger scale of morality and justice than what is, quote, currently legal, end of quote, and we should push our community to be better than what the laws and contemporary discourse allow. In addition to free speech, not equaling the freedom to any platform of speech, several speakers invited to campus intended to use their speech hatefully and violently. For example, if undocumented students feel threatened by a provocateur's speech, the speech is a form of violence. Hannah Arendt claims that violence and power cannot coexist as violence pushes out the productive force of collaboration that we know as, quote, powerful, unquote. Similarly, power pushes out the destructive force of violence. Threats indicate violence and therefore obliterate power. Speech that is hateful and violent, though may not be hate speech, legally speaking, obliterates campus power and productivity. On our campus, shouldn't we strive for productive dialogue and power rather than crushing discourse by allowing this divisive and hateful platforms to instigate violence? Through this plat framework, if we truly claim to promote freedom of speech, we would allow provocative speakers onto campus only if we truly believed it would further the discussion in a productive manner. Conversely, we would not allow speakers to campus if we knew their intentions were grim and indicative of violence. Voltaire, a thinker our founding fathers idolized, claims that we should defend, quote, to the death, unquote, people's right to say something we may not agree with. I agree with this. We should defend disagreement. We should not, however, defend other people's right to threaten, to incite violence, to belittle, and undermine our standards and mission of community on campus. This is unacceptable. From a less philosophical, more experiential perspective, defending these provocative speakers on our campus harms our students from minority and or marginalized backgrounds more overtly and intimately than the students who claim to be oppressed on campus. Oppression relies on systemic and historic networks that disproportionately affect people of color, people who are disabled, people of sexual and gender orientations other than straight or cisgender, people who are women, people who are low income, people who are not citizens, people who are uneducated, people who may not have others in their community who speak the language or look like them. Oppression is not a small yet vocal group of white students who make the choice to co-opt the free speech movement for their own political decisions. Unlike identity, which cannot be removed from us and is not a choice, political affiliation is a complete choice. There must be a more powerful and productive way to promote dialogue and discourse across political party lines than enabling hateful speakers to ruin our campus's principles of community and regular education and business operations. From a staff perspective, the increased militarized security was inappropriate and triggering. I can only imagine how some students felt when outside anti-fascist and conservative provocateurs came onto our campus with murky ulterior motives. Though their intentions may be pure, not everyone has the privilege of identifying the police with safety, and we shouldn't assume that providing additional security necessarily makes everyone feel more secure. Please consider this testimony in place of my spoken word at the Free Speech Commission. The task is not easy to promote discourse that includes all narratives, but it is one of the most pressing issues of our time, and the solutions need to start at UC Berkeley. Context matters, and as philosopher J.L. Austin has written, our word is our bond. Thank you for your time. All the best, Brian. And he's the coordinator of the Green Initiative Fund. Okay, it falls to me to read the final um, written submission, which is from Heidi Sachs of Cal Zero Waste. Um, she writes, wanted to give my respect to UCB, 
Good idea in asking for feedback on our free speech predicament. I wishes I was a genius and could think of a nonviolent free speech pathway. Do we have any, anyone else who wants to speak? Or just make a comment? Chairs, would we like to close the public yeah, comment uh, period? Oh, no, we do have a. Oh, sorry. Would you like to come up to the. Would you like to speak? Yeah, speak up to the front. I'll hand you the mic. Could you also sign in, please? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is David. I'd just like to give some thoughts on the, on the uh, well, what we're all gathered here today. I'd like to start by saying that, first off, nobody is happy about the amount of money that had to be spent over the last year um, securing the right of people to speak on this campus. Uh, by my count, it's been well over a million dollars that we otherwise um, would not have had to spend. That money could have been spent on scholarships, on hiring our excellent staff of professors, or even just paying down the deficit that I know we're facing. Um, but unfortunately, this is not an ideal world, and uh, Unfortunately, violent vandals, the, in this case the intellectual descendants of East German communists, have decided that they will, through force of arms, come on our campus and uh, decide what the acceptable bounds of speech are. Um, you know, no, nobody thinks this is the right way to do this. Nobody here thinks that we ought to allow people to beat their worldview into other people to decide what we all can think and say. We have laws against this kind of thing, um, laws enforced by our brave men and women in blue. Uh, the problem here is that uh, the UCPD is funded, uh, at least in part, by the university, and instead of the taxpayer, um, paying for our, our common safety, uh, the university has had to pick up some of that tab. Um, like I said, normally we the people pay for uh, the defense of our own individual rights. Perhaps the California taxpayer ought to be paying at least a portion of this, but I, I didn't come here to talk about the funding structure. Um, obviously, again, student groups are not being asked to pay the full uh, security cost of this. Nobody thinks that it would be reasonable to ask a student group to pay half a million dollars to have a campus, uh, to have a speaker here on campus. That's obviously a non-starter. Uh, and while it's true that student groups aren't being asked to pay even tens of thousands of dollars, asking them to come up with thousands of dollars, five thousand, ten thousand dollars, is essentially a, a prohibition on inviting a, any speaker that might be dermed, that might be deemed controversial by these outside groups who show up to incite violence. Uh, by looking at the, the budgets given to the registered student organizations, anyone can see that they don't have the money even in a year to fund a single speaker. And so instead of you know, outside groups uh, using violence to determine who will be allowed to speak on campus, the de facto state of affairs under the new major events policy would be that outside groups would decide with money rather than with threats who can come to speak on campus. If the cost for a student group to bring a speaker here is prohibitive to their own means. If they can't raise that money themselves, then they end up turning, turning to David Koch or George Soros to say, hat in hand, will you fund our political speech? And again, it is not the students themselves, but outside groups using us as a, sh a show platform for their own ideas who end up determining what is brought here on campus. Th this, again, should not be the state of affairs. And well, it is important to, to realize that Every decision has costs that bringing uh, people to speak on campus who will not have the support of the campus community, who will cause some people anguish, who will make people uncomfortable, does need to be, thought, uh, be taken into consideration when deciding what, uh, what speakers are to be brought. Asking student groups to pay uh, 
security fees in excess of what they're able to fund from their um, given funds, asking them in essence to turn to outside money to fund their speech on campus gives away the, the integrity and in, in a sense the, the very ownership of that uh, group's identity to outside people who are willing to pay for this. And so I would like to submit to the campus uh, at large and to all those gathered here specifically um, that we should not ask student groups to pay amounts which they cannot reasonably come up with themselves, uh, but rather should ask them to think about their uh, policies before we ask them um, in, in, in exchange. Questions for the speaker? Uh, so you've uh, spoken about the uh, costs associated with ensuring security on campus in case of uh, some you know, potentially controversial speaker, but I, I imagine that there are plenty of speakers which uh, student groups might want to invite which would not be considered controversial at all or not really uh, considered by the UCBD necessary. It would not be considered by the UCBD necessary to put up a barriers or things like this. Uh, and so for these groups, there uh, probably wouldn't be a security cost associated. Uh, so do you think that it is, uh, there, there would still be some costs associated with these groups which ostensibly have uh, no potentially dangerous speakers being invited? Well, one would think that certain people would not be controversial, but I would take as a counterpoint the example of Ben Shapiro. He came to campus in 2016, and the university didn't have to pay out any money for him coming here. There was no security. There was no big shutdowns of parts of campus. He came and spoke in VLSB. Uh, he brought one of his own people for security, and he just came and went, spoke to the people who wanted to hear him, took questions from people who disagreed with him, and went peacefully. There was no controversy over any of that. However, he came again, as last year, as you all know, we s spent something like six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars on security. And this is the same guy, and he gave, I was at both of them, nearly the same speech. The, the fact that in the space of less than two years, in the space of 18 months, speech can change from completely benign, from completely within the bounds of, of discourse, to something so bad that we're going to have to set up massive protests to stop it, and in counterpoint, set up security to stop the, the protesters from shutting it down, shows that the bounds of acceptable discourse are entirely malleable uh, in, in the heat of the moment. Uh, just a point of information, I think uh, we now have a, a major events policy in place, um, and my understanding is that under the terms of the major events policy, the extraordinary security costs, uh, when they arise, are the responsibility of the campus. Is that right? Not the event? Could we get that, clarification on that? That's correct. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a oh. okay, so my question is, do you think that um, making it easier for groups to um, invite speakers without the financial burden of um, paying for security, uh, would in the long run, would those costs be less? Um, if we're like, if the university is paying the five to $10,000 for UCPD securing an event um, for more events, might that, um, might that end up costing more than the incidental security from large scale events that the threat was not anticipated for? Or do you think that would be something that we could uh, level out and uh, end up saving money in the long run? Um, I don't have the long term financial information to know what has happened in the past, but I think that part of the reason that um, that the Ben Shapiro event, again, was so large is because the vandals were allowed to have their way, not in any insult to UCPD. They did not expect the kind of response that came to the Milo Yiannopoulos event, but because they, their goals were achieved and they said, we can, through force of arms, shut this down, I think that is why the there has been such concern about 
uh, security in the future uh, if we all had known what was going to happen in, in February beforehand and had the kind of um, security that we had for Shapiro here for Unopolis, then I, don't, I think these outside groups from off of campus would not have thought they would be able to do this and it would have been you know, a, a 10,000 to 20,000 expense for Shapiro instead of the enormous uh, expense that it was. So I think in the long term, um, when we say this kind of uh, thing is not acceptable, that whatever you try, we will stop you. We will defend everyone's right to speak. I think that these groups will then say, this, this isn't working for us. We can't do what we want to do this way. And so I think that they wouldn't have this problem in the future. Any further questions? Yes, certainly. Thank you. I'm struck by your comparison of um, uh, Mr. Shapiro's uh, appearance here earlier um, in 2016, was it? And then in 2017. And I wonder if you would say something about the current political climate that we're in and also that there um, was a major event in the nation on another, uh, uh, on another college campus, a university campus, the University of Virginia, Virginia that preceded our events that might have also weighed into how... Uh, some of these external parties may have reacted. So um, how does the context, the political climate, do you think, and the um, also what's going on around the nation, how do you think that, that do you think that would maintain itself and sustain? Could things change and we might not have to be worried about these? Is this actually a consequence of the moment, of the political moment we're in? Um, first, by political climate, are you referring to the election of, of Trump as president? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, I think there's quite a bit of um, discourse about the divisiveness in the country right now. There's a lot of social division. But we also had at the University of Virginia, in the aftermath of that, that march, we had a young woman to lose her life. Um, and there was a lot of protest around that. So there are a lot of incidents that are going around college campuses now in response, yes, uh, to the election. So I would attribute that to the political climate, yes. Uh, in the case of Ben Shapiro specifically, um, I, it doesn't seem logical to me that opposition to him would be driven by opposition to the current uh, political leadership. Um, again, Mr. Shapiro specifically has been an outspoken opponent of Donald Trump through the primaries and against um, the kind of uh, alt-right uh, racist um, groups that have been um, you know, kind of holding our nation hostage to their viewpoints. Um, I, I think... Uh, I think it was NBC said that he was the largest recipient of anti-Semitic hate mail over the last year. So with this specifically, I don't think the the increased uh, ardor against Mr. Shapiro can be attributed to the climate. I think that in, in this climate, however, when we have lots of people who are unhappy with each other's opinions, who uh, who because some people are willing to bring violence into this, because we do have um, you know, racists marching, because we do have Antifa coming out here to, to beat people, that there is an increased, um, uh, increased fear of, of violence and of marginalization in this moment. I don't think that will persist. Um, you know, it might persist for another year or two, but I don't think that will ever become the new normal where people will feel that we can come out and, and forcefully shove our viewpoints down other people's throats unless everyone at large, or by and large, decides that we are going to tolerate this by not shutting it down, by not um, forcefully putting um, those who commit crimes or punishing for their crimes, putting them behind bars, whatever the punishment under the law is, um, if we don't take uh, prosecution to the extent of the law here and we teach through example that these kind of um, things are acceptable and I think we will have more of this problem, I think that you're right that because of the political climate especially, this is a thing that you know, began in you know, late 2016, early 2017, but I don't think it will remain the status quo that we have to spend half a million dollars to bring somebody who was, you know, previously, you know, un not especially uh, amazing to the campus community. I think if somebody wanted to bring, you know, uh, Richard Spencer or uh, Fidel Jr., or, well, not Fidel Jr. anymore, but somebody on the, on the extreme ends of the political campus, of the political climate, then that will remain controversial. And if we want to bring, you know, avowed white supremacists or, um, uh, you know, those who advocate 
actual violence who talk about overthrowing the government or, or hating entire groups of people, I think that will remain a problem, but I don't think that by and large people like um, Shapiro or Prager or, you know, or, or any of the talking heads on, on news networks would, would remain a problem for the campus like this. Any further questions? Thank you, David. Further comments from members of the campus community? Would anybody else like to speak? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Make sure to sign in. Um, hello, uh, my name is Jalen Banks, and um, forgive me, this is impromptu. I'm sure as all, you all can tell by the cutoff sweatshorts and t-shirt, um, <laughs> but uh, so I will be very brief. Um, I know that this is a this is a council to discuss the free speech movements that are occurring around campus, and. Um, you know, this is my this is my second semester. I'm a freshman here at Cal, and I'm out of state. So I actually come from Virginia. Um, a lot of my friends decided to go to um, the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, where these white supremacists did come. And unfortunately, um, you know, someone ended up losing their life because of this hatred. Um, and as an out of state student, I'm sure you all know the tuition is higher. I came to Cal. And I had wanted to come to Cal since I was a child because of its reputation for being inclusive. And it's, it was supposed to be an environment where I felt welcome and all this stuff. And that's not to say that I don't. I mean, I think Cal is still a great place. Um, I'm sure, as you can imagine, it was a little off-putting, to say the least, to come to Cal in my first semester, have talks of Nazi, people who claim to be Nazis. They call themselves Nazis. Um, and the alt-right coming here. And they 100% don't have the campus's best interest in mind. And um, I don't think they have my best mind personally in their best, or my best interest in their minds either. So basically all I really wanted to say is that I understand that this is a public campus and that Berkeley has a long tradition of facilitating free speech. And that is so important. It is so important to have this open dialogue and to allow people to express their viewpoints. However, um, we all know that it took it, 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 it took a lot of resources to facilitate these, these securities and whatever other things that these controversial speakers needed. And now tuition is being raised. And it, what it honestly feels like is that I'm paying to be victimized. It feels like I'm paying for people who claim to be Nazis to come to the campus. And, you know, I understand that this, again, is a public campus and that free speech is so important. But these are just my, my feelings. Again, this is impromptu, so forgive me. Um, but that's honestly the feelings that I've been having as you know a first semester freshman here at Cal, or now second semester. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, I, I want free speech to continue to be a tradition here. I, I truly do. But not at the expense of students' emotional and physical well-being. And their literal expense, <laughs> so thank you. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Okay. Hey. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to speak? Chairs, are we ready to close the public yeah, comments? Yeah, I guess if there, are, if there are not any further public comments, um, then we should perhaps adjourn. Oh, sorry? So there are new people coming in. Oh. Uh, would Did you, you want to speak? Would you be interested in making a, um, a public statement to the? We were, we were just about to close down. We were just about to close down the public. Um, 
phase of our meeting. Um, uh, since we have no further um, members of the campus community who who wish to make a statement, but if you if you'd like to make, sure, okay, <laughs> please sign in. If you could sign in, sure. So I'm Pam Gleason. I'm I'm very sorry I'm late. Um, I I'm sorry that I don't know what happened here before, but um, I just want to say uh, I do uh, tours for the for the campus for Airbnb. Um, just been doing it for a few months. Uh, attended lots of wonderful tours given by the students over the years and uh, decided that I too share the pride in this campus and wanted to express it to everybody in the world. And so most of my uh, tour members are, are from all over the world. And um, I started the tours in September, um, uh, right during all of the right wing hate speech, speech speakers who are coming here. You know, and I really realized I have such a pride. The reason I'm here is because um, the story really changed um, in, this, in September. And the way it changed is that um, we went from being reactive to proactive. And I just wanna, I, I don't know, um, Carol Christ isn't here, but she did a wonderful job turning around the message and, and getting donors involved for us to be able to afford the $800,000 to um, have the security, to have Milo Yiannopoulos here. And I just thought it was really, um, it was really brave and amazing because it was, you know, we were here we are supporting free speech and that's the history of their campus. That's why people go on my tours is because they know that, you know, this is where it all began. This is where the idea of protest in the US really began. So um, I guess I just wanna say thank you for all the efforts that have happened in the last year because I really do think that there is a change and um, I just hope we can continue in that vein. Um, I believe really firmly in f free speech. I'm sure all of you who are here also do. <laughs> and. Um, I just have, just wanted to share that I I do feel really proud about all the efforts that we've made recently. Any Thank questions? you very much. Any questions for the speaker? Good. Then um, yeah, um, Prudence Carter and I then uh, would like to thank all of you for uh, for your feedback and for your um, thoughtful attention to these issues, these difficult and interesting and important issues uh, about our campus free speech policies. We have one further public hearing that will take place this coming Friday afternoon and an announcement will be going out uh, in the next day or two uh, to provide information about the specific issues we would invite feedback uh, on at that session so there will be one more opportunity for members of the campus community to to offer their perspectives and um, uh, in the meantime i'd like to yeah thank you very much for your for your interest and for coming around and for offering us your thoughts um, thank you very much <laughs>